Well, um, first of all, I just want to, to thank uh, the EduLearn Lab and, and Albert and uh, Lourdes and uh, Amante for uh, the invitation to be here because it's absolutely fantastic and it's been extremely interesting. And I, I, have, I, I really like the ecology metaphor. It's a lot to play with. So what you're going to see here is a number of ideas that are playing with that. And um, if I can hit the right down button. Mm. Let's try. What's next? Oh, hit that one. Um, here's the, the, the kind of questions I was uh, asked to address. Um, and the first thing I should say that I'm going to talk about social networks. And to be clear, I am not talking about Facebook or Twitter or um, LinkedIn or whatever the local uh, social networking sites are, I'm talking about social networks from a social network analytic uh, perspective on how, who talks to whom, about what, and, and so on. So uh, in this context, I was asked to address uh, what are the kinds of networks people can use to create and strengthen their personal ecologies for learning? What is the impact of strong or weak ties? And I won't go through what those are between the different elements in our learning ecologies. And what do we need to know to take the best advantage of our social and learning networks? So uh, starting off with ecologies and networks, I, I had to go and look up a definition uh, just to see where our uh, similarities were it, between the idea of ecology and uh, social networks. So, and this is a little bit out of focus. Those who probably know the, the red greens are not quite coalescing in the, in the image, but so I, I hope you can see it there. Uh, it's perfectly fine on my screen and on my paper. <laughs> so anyway, ecologies. Um, and this is from a British site, the scientific study of the distribution, abundance, and dynamics of organisms, their interactions with other organisms and with their physical environment. And of course, as a social network analyst, the minute you see the word interactions, you say, yes, I'm home. I'm, I've got it. So what is social network? analysis, the study of the types and patterns of interactions among actors in a social system. So there we have interactions in a social system. Please read exactly into that ecosystem. And the social structures that emerge, the roles and positions in the, the, of the actors in the network, and how that affects them and the network as a whole. And I'm going to show you lots of pictures to, uh, to illustrate that. Um, as well, I look at socio-technical studies, so it's not just the, the interaction among people, it's how they are, uh, the interaction between the people and the technology. So here I'm interacting with the technologies of the desk, the, the, um, the, uh, the PowerPoint, the hard hardware, um, etc. And so what I am doing is, uh, it's going to be somewhat constrained or facilitated by the technology that's there. So that, that wraps into what I'm looking at as well. So just to briefly, oh, do notice the bear. I just love this. Don't you love hanging out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, this is Vancouver Island, <laughs> where we were walking, my brother and I and family. So uh, yeah, bears. <laughs> uh, social network analysis. So the very, very basics of it, as they say, is actors tied by relations that form networks. And of course, we, we visualize these as graphs, and you will have seen lots of these. Uh, but also, the analyses come from graph theory. So the, 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 it's a, both a methodology and a perspective. Because what you're doing is asking questions of people, not about what everybody in this room does, but what you do with others. So it's very much is what, how does what you do with somebody else configured create the configuration of the entire uh, look of the, uh, the network. And, and as, as Rose was mentioning about the connections between the resources that are out there as well. So I pulled two definitions there, community. I've always been very interested in, in virtual community. So what is the, the uh, what in ecology, it's all the species uh, in a defined spatial area or ecosystem which interact directly or indirectly or share interaction and links with other species. So then when we look at what we're looking at for a social network community, a virtual community, if you like, a learning community, is exactly the same thing, but we call it that because we see that pattern emerging. So it's really, the, it's, uh, it, a community emerges, and I always say community is a hypothesis to be tested, to see whether it's there, even with a network configuration that looks like a community, you want to ask people, do they feel they belong to a community and, and why? 
So what can these networks tell us about learning ecologies, ecosystems, and communities? That didn't do anything. Uh, one of the first things, it can t it, by looking at it th from this perspective, we can start saying what kind of interactions uh, are involved in those networks, those, those collective identities that people say, I belong to a learning community. What is it that's there? And we, we're very concerned, of course, with, with the know what. How do you, you know, di did the person learn it? What did they learn? What's the actual knowledge? But we've also got the know-how, especially if we're thinking about professionals trying, trying to learn the norms of their profession, um, and uh, the know-who. Know-who is one that's very uh, uh, important in this social network analysis. It's knowing who knows, who knows what, and who, who, who's the person you go to? Who's your, your technology guru? We called in somebody before to check it out, right? Uh, who, who's your learning expert? Um, who's the person who's best at translating computer science concepts, <laughs> Rose, into uh, learning language? So these, these are the kind of things that we're looking for in, in, in knowing who knows, who knows what. We're looking for our technology gurus. Now, a lot of this is about also what you're learning in these learning communities is the norms and practices. And one of the things I've written about is, is becoming an e-learner. I really like to see Norman's uh, uh, slide there, the, the, the student becoming an archaeologist. It's a wonderful book, um, uh, The Boys in White, about, about boys becoming, men becoming doctors and what they learned about how to be a doctor, what it means to be a, a doctor. So uh, I've written a lot about what becoming an e-learner and how it, people have to adopt the, the conventions of that, um, that environment. And sometimes they don't know what they have to do. But one thing I want to say is that interactions are way more than, in any ecosystem, are way more than factual knowledge. Uh, you have, uh, from a, these come from a number of studies I've done, the kind of things that tied people together in these, these uh, learning networks. Uh, one was in a computer science department, one of the work products were very important, the writing and programming, writing together and programming together. Work products were coming out important. Another interdisciplinary uh, science teams uh, yes, some passing of the field knowledge was important. And in teachers, uh, in teachers who are learning, uh, who are science teachers, um, uh, grade school science teachers, the science content was one of the, the work products that they needed to know about. But equally important was the, the work practices, the know-how. And particularly those teachers didn't, you know, science content was fine but how do I teach it in the classroom? How do I manage the classroom? How do I get the exercise that makes it sense? So it's not that they needed to know about the content of science, they needed to know how to, how to explain that in a classroom. So the other things that get kind of important are career support, um, social interaction, of course. Um, I, I think, um, again, Nor, Nor mentioned how the people who'd engaged more emotionally were more tied in, in, in that environment and they did better social interaction, emotional support. These are also things that, that uh, make up an ecosystem. Well, what happens with these ecosystems? All those interactions are gonna configure your, your ecosystem. So here's a couple of networks, and since they're in the same colors, they aren't quite in sync. I, but I think basically you can see it clusters in, in one big cluster over there, and it clusters in a, in a kind of a skinny cluster in the middle with lots of dots around the edge, even if, even if you're seeing more dots than you should. Uh, but the, what we're looking at here are, is the main communication um, interaction mode in two different MOOCs. So this one is a connectionist MOOC, deliberately created to create connections between people. And this is the Twitter pattern who tweeted or retweeted other people's work. So what we've got there is a big cluster in the middle, very few isolates. Uh, this other one was, um, is a discussion board, and I make no claim that the person wasn't teaching well in this class or that they weren't connecting in some other way. But the main discussion tool, the discussion board, was obviously not so, uh, not drawing in the full crowd. So the question is here, if I'm looking at this ecosystem, this network, what do I want to do as, as an instructor? Does this look good? Am I happy with this? Would I rather have that? And it goes back to what do you want, again, what, what is the goal here in, in, in teaching? Do you want everybody to talk to everybody, which can be a bit chaos if you've got thousands of people, but do you want it to be somehow engaged? And if you take this one, you take those apart, you can see the different colors, you take those all apart, there's a TA associated with each one of those colors. There's only one little network in there which is not TA driven. So most of the time in collaborative learning, we want t students to, to, um, to start 
bootstrap, doing it themselves, talking to each other, learning from each other. So if, it, it, to see where a TA is continuously needed is uh, an important perhaps starting phase. And then you want to see, can the TA withdraw and can, and so that the, the, the community can go on by itself. And I'll show a picture about that a bit later. So the, the networks also tell us about reach. How far am I reaching? How, how big is my ecosystem? Over there. Um, so this is, uh, this is a network that looks at uh, connections. Again, uh, we were doing teaching the teachers. They were being exposed to new science teaching at the university, and they were supposed to teach others about it. So what were we getting? Were they teaching others? How connected were they? So what we can see is actually a large cluster over this side, and that's actually um, among the high schools. And what you see is a connection over here, which is now the connection to the, to the grade schools, to the younger, the, the younger years. And the important for us to notice is there's one connection. So again, as, as people who are trying to get the, the, the reach of this, are we happy that there's at least one connection? But having seen that, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to use that to adjust our ecosystem? Uh, so one of the things about these uh, in a brand new areas is we might want to ask what kind of a person is that one in the middle? Are we getting a new species? And so we've had a number of studies that show we are getting a few new species uh, coming out in virtual uh, learning environments. Um, uh, Christian Preston uh, has a Mir uh, Miranda Net. I don't know if you know Miranda Net. It's a, an online uh, and, um, learning community for people who use to use IT in education, and she found a set of people who now were e-facilitators, who shape the argument, uh, braiders, the people who bring a couple of different arguments together, and then the, the accomplished fellows was a stage where people said, okay, I've got this, I've got this, I'm going to translate it for another audience, so I, I might call them translators. But we've got these different roles coming out, nobody expected that. Uh, similarly, uh, Ria Montague, in looking at online learners, found the concept of learner leaders, so yes, it, it wasn't supposed to be just the person, at, you know, the sage on the stage. Uh, there is this distribution so that there were students in the online learning environment who were beginning to lead the discussion, bring in information, ask questions. Um, again, very important for, for uh, getting the community working on its own. So the um, a bit much more recent study um, by Pollock and, and colleagues uh, found that there were emerging the roles of explainers and synthesizers and support. She was uh, looking at uh, people uh, supporting low-income uh, uh, people in learning environments and found some of it was very much supporting the students with their learning experience as well, because if they, they hadn't necessarily had as much experience going through the learning process. So supporting them saying, yes, this is, you're right, you should only know this much at this point, don't worry, keep going. So they have whole different kinds of roles. And they, all these things are the interactions that keep the learning ecosystem going. <clears throat> so the question of what matters in networks, <clears throat> as I said, it, it, I mean, I should say that the networks are beautiful pictures, but they're, not more, they're more than pretty pictures. Uh, there are interactions that, and ways you can actually analyze. So I always go back to this diagram. It's the very first uh, network picture that I drew from my own research. And you can, f you can see fairly easily how clustered th there are. In there are cliques. It's pretty easy to see. One, two, three, four cliques. So what the network uh, analysis, uh, the statistical analysis showed me before were that these cliques existed. And then by the time I draw the picture, you go, aha, that's pretty obvious. So that's, that's an eco, the ecosystem um, there. And so we're often interested in how central people are. Uh, we're, we're interested, so you can see the person right in the middle. I've, I've noted them as a network star. But they're also a broker because they connect two pieces to, of the network together. If you take them out, the network tends to fall apart into, into several pieces. So these are the kind of things that we're, we're looking at. And, and again, uh, to see whether what interactions and what role that central person plays in, in, your, in the learning environment. So some of the things that uh, we, we've probably all heard about strong ties and weak ties. So just to uh, refresh everybody, strong ties, <coughs> of course, are your, your friends, your colleagues, um, your close friends. Um, and uh, Norma talked about not getting feedback from 
oh, getting feedback for his book from personal contacts. So those strong ties are the people who care about you. They care about what you're doing. They're going to come in and help you. The only th the catch is that they only have access to resources that are very similar to yours because we tend to be like we tend to be the same as our close ties. So then we get the idea of the strength of weak ties, which is the and this is the the wonderful aspect of uh, 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 meetings like this is that you get to hear from from people you don't know you didn't know before that you don't know well and they have information that's different from yours so we've had uh, we've had, we know three different presentations now four different presentations and we're able to bring bring that information in uh, through our weak ties so what I just noted at the bottom there was in creating these ecosystems, you want to foster strong ties for trust and commitment, community commitment, commitment to the relationships and a, and a continuing relationship, and weak ties for new ideas and perspectives and techniques. So how do we use this network information to enhance the learning ecology use? Well, one of the things, if we go back to that uh, picture that I showed before, what this actually showed me was that decisions about the organization of the learning activities created the configuration among interactions. So it was really a matter of being aware that when you put people in groups, quite obviously, they're only going to talk to the people in groups. And you're not going to get that widespread, uh, you're not going to get as much in the widespread interaction. So uh, it's the decisions about what you're doing in the learning activity, to remember that those are actually going to structure, going to create the pattern of interactions that define your ecosystem. The other thing that matters um, is decisions about the media affect the uh, community. So this is a combination between the, the impact of the learning organization. So the, the class, pictures you have there, that's all one class, that's a, a chat, a discussion board, and an email. Um, the, the organizer wanted, the, the, the teacher used a um, chat for a live session once a week and discussion over the week. So you can see that the chat's connecting a lot of people, discussion because there were required discussions and it's also connecting a lot of people. But the e email is now collecting, connecting just those members of that group again. So what you can see here is that the people who are strongly tied in those groups if you take away chat or the discussion board, they're going to keep going. But what about the people who weren't in group, the connections that are pe between people who are not in groups together? Then that's going, you take away discussion or chat, they don't have a channel anymore. So what came uh, to my mind from this, um, and actually these are stacked, if you think about the email people, the, is the discussion is stacked on top of that, the chat's discussed. Is, is stacked on top of that. So the, so the people with the closest ties are using all the media. The people with the weakest ties are only using what has been set up by the instructor as the way to meet. So then you start thinking about, well, look at how that medium choice structured where people are going to meet. And exactly, this, this, these kinds of meetings are exactly the kind of thing. Albert sets up a meeting. And everybody comes to this room, and this is what I call a latent tie structure. So you, so you haven't met each other, but this structure lets you meet each other, and hopefully you'll start having some weak tie connections, and maybe some stronger tie connections, and they'll come out in different configurations. But this latent tie structure is enabled by somebody, not by anybody in the room, but by the authority outside the room. And that comes up again in something I'm, I'm going to talk about later. And it comes back up in the sense of how ecosystems get, early ecosystems get organized. Where's the organizing force that, that's coming on these and then who has control over these? So uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but then you wanna say, wow, what about the hashtag? It's a latent tie structure. What work does a hashtag do for you? Well, it seems to me it brings people together around common ideas. Uh, so we, we uh, just the same way as a room like this, people outside can, can go back and follow the, the eco4learn hashtag and find out who's there. So again, I mean, it's a, it's a question. I'm still working on this one. Mm. What you're seeing here uh, is um, 
yeah, these are two hashtags. So the, the Healthcare Social Media Canada uh, is a, a Twitter-based a Twitter group. And so that's a hashtag that brings people together. The, um, the other picture there is uh, the first day's tweets for after the Boston Marathon uh, bombings. And so again, it brought people together around that, that topic it, in a virtual concept context. Um, so let's see about using some of this social network information. So now, God, I want to do something with it. Um, my colleague uh, Martin Delat has went around asking people about their network connections, and then he went, this is not coming off a machine, this is coming from people's reports, and says, okay, now I've got their connections, I'm going to draw the network. And then he puts that up in the schools, and lets, this is for teachers, and then teachers will say, oh, look, I can connect over there. Look, there's a bunch of people who are doing what I want to do. I can connect to them. So he's been using that as a way to create an opportunity for connecting uh, to people. Uh, these, this is the Healthcare Social Media Canada group. The, the organizer there really wanted that structure to persist even if she wasn't there. She did not want to be, you didn't, she didn't want to find herself in the center of, of this. And was it working? She believed looking at these, and we all believe looking at these, that what she's got is a, is a one big component of everybody talking to each other. Now the, the colored one over here, um, is the same diagram, but putting on where, what job people came from. She also wanted people to talk on different jobs. So healthcare providers, um, uh, nurses, doctors, etc. They're all in, in this Twitter group. But as you can see, there's no particular cluster of color. So she knows immediately that we're not just stuck with the doctors talking to the doctors, the nurses to the nurses, to the healthcare communicators. So again, She's able to see that she's achieving what she wants in that group, is to get everybody to talk to everybody, and for her to not have to be the person sustaining the conversation. Um, and she very much wanted us to come in and look. Uh, one of my doctoral students is now doing uh, interviews with a lot of members of uh, the people who participate in this, and so we're going to have more from it uh, later to have check on what's going on. OK, I want to talk. A little bit more about applying, but I want to talk about three, three configurations. And this is to beginning to look more at the personal aspects. Um, so what, what about this individual at the center of their, their learning universe? What do they see? What are they engaged with? What's life like at the center of your, we've had some beautiful pictures of, uh, of this people's, people's lives there. I mean, what does it look like from the learning perspective? Um, so, Canada, eh? So I got to have a hockey picture here. This is the Vancouver uh, Thunderbirds. They did actually win this game, so I'm very pleased. So <laughs> I've, I, what I've highlighted there is the, I, I put a ring around the, the referee and what they're watching. So to say, what are they looking at? What does the world look like? And if I wrote, are the errors coming into him? Because he's not talking to them. He's, he's gathering information. So this is a straight uh, network where he's gathering information about everything that's going on. And again, you can see what happens. I just pull that uh, network picture up and put it up the top. You can see what it looks like without the, the, the picture there. But the other way to look at this is this one. It says, okay, there's two teams on the ice. They're looking at each other. Maybe the referee doesn't need to connect with everybody. If they watch certain key players, they can, they can get more information. And over here is the other, this part of the linesman, the other referee here. So that person's another as part of their group. So again, we pick that up. And what we get up there is a network of networks. And it, the important thing about that is that if you, when we talk about personal learning networks, you can just talk about one person, all these hundreds of others. Or you can talk about this one person having three or four connections, each of which connect to five or 10 more. So the load on an individual is much lower if they're connecting to five people than they're collecting to 50. Even though with a network of networks, they can get the benefit of connecting to 50. So if we looked at, uh, well, I was very interested in when I was looking at the uh, online learners to very begin with to understand what their load was. These were cl classes in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. They're very small classes and they max out at about uh, 25. But what did it look like? to a student. What did they see? So this one I call my network egg, and you've got the student at the bottom. They're the yolk. And 
they, what they see is about two to three people that they're very strongly connected to, the people they work with on those projects. Um, this is a compilation across four uh, classes, by the way. Uh, so they see three people. There's about four more who are very visible to them. And then it gets to be going out to this, the intermediate level. And then it goes to, quote unquote, the rest of the class. Now the question is, when you're now looking at something like a MOOC, how big is the network? How much, to make somebody's learning ecology feel good to them, do they need three to seven personal contacts and then the rest of the class, the, th the other thousand? And so you say, well, if I have a thousand in the class, or even if I have 50, how do I make it work for them? What's the load they have to carry? So that's what that's, this picture is about. Now the other one is the network of networks. Um, again, this is, this is uh, drawn from uh, taking the interviews that people had. And what you can see there is about four different clusters. Uh, one cluster, if I can read my own stuff here, one cluster is the other people in the class. Uh, one cluster is their family. And another cluster is work. And the little tiny figure, a little tiny picture there, that's the cat, because there was always a cat that was studying with them. <laughs> a lot of very well-educated cats out there. <laughs> But this, made, when, when and Rose was uh, talking about the zone of available assistance, this is what your zone of, of available assistance can look like. You're just, I'm not quite sure about where the zone of proximal adjustment comes in. But I also thought, for these people, some of this is also a zone of proximal distraction. It's a zone of, of load, because this is what they have to manage. They have to manage people who are, who are not young students coming to a campus and having the lovely seclusion of not having to call mom every day, uh, not having to explain what time you came in, uh, not having to take the dog out for a walk. They have very simple lives. <laughs> and then there's people at home who are juggling all, they're at work all day, they've got, uh, they've got crises at home. Some of these students had uh, you know, older parents they had to take care of at the same time. So again, it is also for a distance student and for adult students can be a, a quite a, a zone of distraction. So they end up looking like this. And my colleague uh, Michelle Kashmir and I, we, we call this juggling multiple social worlds. Here I've changed it to juggling multiple learning worlds. So um, th this is, I actually I saw the picture of Norma Jackson's uh, talk about the lifelong life-wide learning. Um, this is also where an individual is trying to integrate the sense of their multiple experiences as well. So you've got multiple social worlds, you've got multiple media, you've got multiple e-learning worlds, where, worlds, um, and this affects everybody, um, blended online, workplace, personal, personal learners. And I wanted to just pull a little picture from some uh, recent work that we have is looking at, um, it, we've had a uh, questionnaire out there to teachers on social media use in teaching. So we asked them what did they use, what did they use and what did they consume, and uh, what did they in consume, what did they contribute to. So. You can see among these 300 how many different kinds of social media they're using. Talk about juggling different multiple worlds. Now this is media and of course some of those worlds are actually people who are connected through five or six media. But still this is an overwhelming amount of, of technology to, to keep track of. And you know, is the university helping? Well, the orange bars are use of media outside the learning management system, and the blue is learning management use inside. And you can see the only thing that really gets supported in learning management systems is asynchronous discussion. So these are, like Albert's uh, people, these are the avant-garde, these are the people who said we're using a lot of stuff, uh, but it's really quite telling that, that this is not being used um, within the, the university's learning management system, which means there's, there's no uh, instruction because when you ask them, uh, as organizers of use of social media in, in teaching, where do they learn from others about their learning? Um, the ones, of the ones who answered, we get uh, 121 of them out of, I guess this is something around 210 here, uh, they got it from mass media. They're not getting it from local seminars about, um, 30 out of the 200 got it from, um, got their information about social media from workshops at the university, 53%, um, so maybe it's a quarter there, 
uh, got them from personal contacts. And there were some who just said, actually, honestly, I don't really keep up, which is which fine. So they're, they're, that's a cycle, too. We're going to have a certain number of people who are, who are going to be able to keep up and some who are going to not keep up and just keep teaching. Um, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing to find that. It is, it is what's there and the realities of it. So let's find out what's on the next slide because I can't remember. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, I, the, the last thing I want to talk about here is, is throwing out the concept that there's more than one kind of ecosystem that you could be looking at and, and integrating. So <laughs> the two that I want to talk about are crowds and communities. As I said, we've spent so much time talking about communities and trying desperately to create learning communities where, where people could actually uh, believe that the online is as good as offline. And then crowds came along. And they, oh no, what are we supposed to do with those? So there really are two different kinds of learning ecosystems. Um, and they come with two different kinds of responsibilities, uh, roles and responsibilities. So the, the crowds. Um, we've got a centralized effort by uh, anonymous strangers who are contributing. I mean, you can think Wikipedia. Um, they have little expectation that, that people will persist, and I'm not talking about the talk pages or the, the people who really get into it, but the general adding to something like a wiki um, is there's little expectation that they're going to stay. So you don't build your system so that people will, will uh, stay. Um, communities, on the other hand, we really expect that people to, to stay in there. We expect them to commit. We, we, we know who they are. We try and get to know their names. We know who's, who's good at what. And we get this, these two different balances uh, of what the contribu cont contribution uh, patterns are. So in one, also the individual e-learner then is in a crowd is responsible for uh, learning the norms of each of these environments. Remember those multiple worlds? They have to learn the norms of every one of these environments in order to, to go work in there. Um, and the organizers, they have to think about different kinds of responsibilities for what they want to do there. So what I want to do is flip to this picture and talk about if I take my social network principles to the ideas of uh, the ideas of crowds as being collections of weak or not tied people. How are you going to get that contributions there? And again, it was the motivation. Why didn't you get norm? Why, well, you didn't get any uh, responses to your open book. I think there's a there's something here because you are asking them to do a community job when all they're prepared to do in a crowd is a crowd piece job. Small, discreet, you don't have to wait for somebody else to do it. It's, it's lightweight, you don't have to learn a lot to do it. You can go in, correct spelling in Wikipedia and leave. But if you're in a community, it's, I'm, call, I'm calling them now lightweight and heavyweight because I don't want to talk about particular implementations. But if I think about the, the heavyweight aspect of, of uh, something like Wikipedia learning community, there's lots of different roles. People take different, different uh, you can depend on other people. You have different kinds of contributions. People have different things to add. And it matters what somebody else has done. So you're paying attention in a learning community to what's going on. So basically, you get a difference if you're designing one of these. What kind of a knowledge environment do you want? What kind of a learning environment? Do you want one where people are going to be able to just put their little piece in? Again, I talked about the Galaxy Zoo. Where you're going to people have people who are going to just do that one little bit. Takes doesn't take too long to learn. You're not going to give them great rewards for it. There's no status associated with it. Versus a community where status is really important. And I will say, think academia. To be. Uh, in our terminology, an assistant professor, associate, a full professor to get those promotions, to get those publications, to get the invitations to wonderful cities like Barcelona. This reputation matters. So that's what's on the heavyweight side, right? Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I've got this sort of things written uh, in, in lots of other places. You can ask more. I hope you'll ask more questions. The, the little overlapping curve up there, which is very faint, is to remind me to just let you know that not every environment is going to be one or the other. And not every individual, even in a heavyweight community, is going to act like a heavyweight member. So there's some heavyweight communities you may, you may just go and have a look, right? Where there's other ones where you're actually contributing. So it's just to remember that there's a, the difference in the participation and the difference in the uh, construction of these. So um, 
what you get is, is this diversity of engagement. So you have, uh, I, this is basically what I just said, you may be strongly a communal connection in some environments you're in, and you may be just a, a legitimate peripheral participant in another. Now some, you wanna move towards the center. So if it's your career, you wanna move towards that. And we looked at people in open, who were contributing to OpenStreetMap, and a lot of them wanted to, to join that community, get more and related to their career and others you're leaving. And so when, when the online learning courses get to, to the end, people are leaving those environments. So we've got temporal aspects as well, as, as Rose said there. Um, so in the ecosystems, you know, you really want to design, um, you, you also get this finding where something was designed as lightweight gets appropriated and used in a heavyweight sense. So there's some funny things in the distributed computing where they start uh, competing to how many cycles they can donate to distributed computing initiatives. SETI is the, the, the uh, initiative there. And then something that designed as heavyweight can, can uh, support, be supported through lightweight participation as well. So again, we get these different kinds of modules. So um, I want to say, again, how do you take this to help the, your learning ecologies? I would say for, use, use the crowd base when you want to harness um, structured contributions. When you want to smooth, like, like if you want to find out what, what the general population, something you want to use statistics to analyze, then a crowdsourcing is really, you can just accounting, voting, you know, these kinds of things, the smoothing of contributions rather than the recognition of independent contributions. Um, you want to facilitate the crowdsourcing with uh, simple tasks, uh, low entry requirements. You want to reward by individual contribution, not interactions. And you want to maintain a co-orientation to the goals because the only thing that ties people to that enterprise is their interest in that subject. So if we take some of the citizen science things, why are they doing that? Well, they like science. And some of them also like open access. So we looked at OpenStreetMap. Why are people contributing there who don't know anybody else there? Because they like maps, they like geography, and they like open access. And that's what ties them. So the motivation to work in, uh, for, to contribute to a crowd is only going to be towards the interest or predominantly towards the interest uh, in the subject matter. Whereas you get into the community aspect and people are not only interested in the subject matter, they're also interested in making sure that they, they're known by others, that they're creating relationships with others. So again, the, the learning community, but learning crowds aren't a, are, are a nice different kind of ecosystem to look at. So just to uh, wrap up here, uh, we can return to our questions. What are the kinds of networks people can use to create and strengthen their personal ecologies? Um, I think networks of networks to help reduce load and increase uh, reach. What's the impact of stronger weak ties? So you want strong weak ties for commitment to providing information and support and orientation to the, the, uh, the overall purpose as well as the community members. Weak ties for hearing about new ideas and an orientation to interest. And then as organizers, um, you want to, oh sorry, how, what do we need to, to do to take the best advantage of these um, in our social and learning networks? So as individuals, I didn't talk about this, but you'll see that on one of the diagrams, there was one person in the middle, I said that was Sento Star, what happens if you take them out? That person spans a structural whole. So, if you want to take best advantage of learning networks, you got to find where the holes are and fill them or be the person that, that fills them. Fill that structural hole, and it's a wonderful term from Ron, Ron Burt. Um, cultivate, I think you need the variety as individuals of both strong and weak ties because you have to hear new things um, and just try new environments. <laughs> uh, as organizers, you've got to match your strategy to what you want to come out of things and um, expect and plan for learning of ecosystem norms. I said people, you need to learn to be an e-learner. Uh, plan for personal learning networks so that even within your learning community, there's going to be pre people needing a personal learning network to bring their other aspects into line. And manage the entry, participation, and exit because there are, there are temporal aspects of things. So to uh, conclude, um, I'm going around trying to reclaim uh, the term e-learning to mean a transformative moment for learning in a networked world. Um, 
and not about the learning management system. I know e-learning is, a lot of people don't like e-learning e because it means the learning management system, but I think it is the term that we need to use for uh, looking at this transformative moment in who learns what from whom, where, when, and under what circumstances, and these, creating these new ecologies. And I gather we're keeping questions for later, and I hope I spelled questions correctly in Spanish. Good, good. I'm, I got about six words now. So, um, and just leave that last slide there because we're not in questions. Um, a few plugs for my colleagues, social media and society conference. You can still put a paper in January 16th. Uh, that's going to be in London. The learning analytics and knowledge conference is in Edinburgh in April. Uh, there's a network learning conference I didn't, I don't have up there that is in Lancaster in May. So perhaps, perhaps we will continue these ties and see you there.